Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and religion, where it meets at LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. Thank you for giving us a little bit of your time to better understand this intersection and to help us build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ community. I started the episodes thinking uh, that we would really attack or approach uh, this topic at that intersection of, of religion and sexuality specific to uh, Latter-day Saint um, tradition or Mormonism. But lately, through our YouTube channel and the popularity of the Latter-day Stories podcast, it's amazing to me uh, the different faith traditions that have found uh, likeness and the ability to connect with these stories outside of Mormonism. So for those of you who are conservative Christian, Jehovah Witness, Jewish, uh, and other faith traditions that also are met at these intersections, we welcome you uh, to the Latter-day Stories podcast, and we hope that you are able to find a connection to these stories as we do have uh, similar experiences, especially in, in uh, cultures that have, a, have high demand religious uh, in, uh, aspects, and also those who uh, come from lines of orthodoxy where certain traditions and certain experiences are expected of you. So I just wanted to preface that because I, I do want to be sensitive and also uh, give a general welcome to a wide variety of people who, who uh, participate in the Latter-day Stories uh, episodes. So thank you and hello. We also want to welcome those who are listening on the uh, Amazon family uh, podcast network. We are excited to be able to be part of the Amazon Prime podcast network. And those who are watching on video episodes through YouTube and Facebook, the live chat is always open if you're not uh, listening to this episode as it premieres and catching it afterwards. The comment uh, section of the YouTube and Facebook posts are super beneficial to the community because you can share, uh, interact, and react along with other people who are uh, listening or uh, watching this episode. So that's kind of a cool feature as well. So without that, or with all that aside and without further ado, I want to welcome um, to the Latter-day Stories podcast a friend of mine and, and uh, just a beautiful soul uh, when it comes to this space. I want to welcome to the Latter-day Stories podcast, Flo Monteerth. Hi, thank you. I'm excited to have you here, Flo. Thanks. Um, it's good to be here. Uh, I didn't tease this episode a lot, but there's a lot of complexities to your story. Uh, you, you're not the traditional um, Latter-day Stories uh, episode interviewee um, because you're not approaching this subject specifically as someone within uh, the LGBTQ spectrum. A lot of what we'll talk about today in the beginning of your story uh, relates to a relationship, uh, your husband, who came out to you, and the mixed orientation marriage uh, portion of, of your story. Yeah. I just first want to say thank you um, for opening yourself up to giving us an opportunity to see what the non-straight and straight spouse experience is like in a mixed orientation marriage, and specifically how that relates to Mormonism and the pressures that uh, religious institutions place on uh, individuals and couples, particularly as they then start exploring and understanding their sexuality. So I know this is, this is going to be a, a deep dive into a subject that doesn't get a lot of airtime, and I'm thankful that you are willing to uh, step up and, and share that part of, of your journey candidly and uh, sometimes vulnerably to this audience. Thank you for having me. So uh, to help the listeners better understand uh, a little bit more about you, tell us about who Flo is. Um, well, I was a BYU baby, born at Brigham Young University. My parents um, are converts. They joined the church in Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, then they immigrated up to Canada and I grew up there. Uh, they were very much into the religion. Dad joined uh, through a scoutmaster back when he was young, and his sister was apparently a member as well, though not active. And then mom, she'd seen the missionaries for years, apparently. Until then, she joined and uh, very much in uh, the religion. And grew up doing family home evening, going to church, doing all the callings, all those sorts of things. So, uh, What do you do professionally? Uh, professionally, I'm a school teacher currently. I am teaching middle school science. I am 
going to end this school year and go to school full time and pursuing my master's in social work. Um, now I'm just uh, being presumptuous, but this journey that you've been on over the last couple of years probably lends uh, some opportunity to share some expertise and, and the opportunity to help other people who uh, in that social space, mental health, counseling, uh, therapeutical services that so desperately need it. Yeah, that, that's ultimately the hope. I want to um, counsel specifically working with uh, LGBTQ individuals and parents of those individuals and um, spouses and, and then also those uh, dealing with religious trauma. I love it. Uh, so great introduction. Uh, I hope our audience is able to, uh, to really grasp the beauty and the uniqueness of, of this episode. Where do, we, where do we begin the story? Um, often, many women in your situation who marry uh, not non-straight spouses are wholly and fully unaware that their husbands are gay um, or not completely straight. Where does your story begin? And how did you find yourself in the Latter-day Story studio? Um, so, unlike a lot of those women, I actually knew that my ex was gay uh, before we married. And um, I, it's probably a testament to how much I bought into what I was being told uh, by the church um, for me to have continued with that choice. And so, a little bit different in that way. Um, Let's, uh, I, I wanted, we discussed this off the air um, before we started the episode, and it's never my intent to have one spouse uh, tell the story of another spouse. Mm -hmm. But what background um, can we get to utter, understand what that revelation sounded like? What, what you actually did know about uh, your husband's sexuality? And, and what do you do with that information? Um, so prior to meeting him, I had been dating another a young man and um, we had been engaged and it hadn't worked out and it turned out that he had, um, he was into pornography and it more, it wasn't that I was, I had an issue with the pornography so much as it was that he had been very vocal about his roommate using his computer for it and how against that it was. It was more the hypocrisy that bothered me. So when I moved from Utah out to Arizona, it was one of the things I had talked about uh, with people. I, in fact, I had absolutely no intention of going into a relationship seriously. Uh, but you know, single wards being single wards, uh, uh, he heard me playing piano, was super interested getting to know me, and, and uh, uh, he asked me out. Uh, and he would hear this story about um, this individual. And, how I felt about the deception. And so when we got super serious, uh, he felt like he couldn't uh, not be honest with me. So he explained on um, the first evening that he had troubles with pornography. And I, I listened to him and I, I thought, well, you know, I've done some study on this. I know that it's a lot about connection and, and I think we can work through this. Um, and I thought it was done <laughs> until the following evening. Uh, he sat me down and he said, well, there's a little bit more to the story. Uh, and he explained that he enjoyed looking at um, porn of men. And so I kind of sat there a little bit perturbed. And then he reassured me and just said, you know, I, I really think, though, I'm bisexual because um, he felt deeply attracted to me and um, that, you know, that maybe all of this would change. I, there was for him, I think, when I look back on it, I think he was almost positive that I would end the relationship. Um, and for myself, in the moment, I, I just remembered feeling so much um, honor that he trusted me with this information. He explained that uh, he hadn't told anyone else, that he was forced to tell his parents and that there were siblings that didn't know. And so the fact that he volunteered all this information to me was uh, 
just really powerful in helping me know how much he trusted me. And in my life, I was seeking for connection and uh, very real people and uh, felt like I could then build on it, that if we could be honest with each other now before we were married, then, then surely we could make something of it. And then along with that was, you know, what was typical of what the LDS church asks, you know, to pray and ponder. And, and uh, as I had prayed and pondered, I just, I had felt this warmth and I thought, well, you know, we can make this work. Um, after all, President Kimball had said something to the effect that, you know, it doesn't necessarily take any one person. If both sides are willing to make a marriage work, then it could work. And so I went in full hearted um, and, you know, took on the advice of all the other bishops and the church and what I'd hear from general authorities about doing all the things, uh, may, reading my scriptures, going to the temple, uh, doing our callings, that if I would be faithful in doing those things, that God would uh, make, help our marriage work, help um, heal uh, each of us, and uh, we would achieve, you know, the ideal the heterosexual family bound together for eternity. I want to uh, definitely explore that part of the story. Uh, I want to talk about expectation, because mm -hmm. I think that might be a great place to begin. Um, when, as we kind of unfold this, this interview, I think we're going to talk a lot about uh, give and take, a lot about expectation, uh, a lot about uh, companionship, and where one struggles, the other lifts. And this, this uh, give and take that is required in, in all relationships. So I want to begin um, by better understanding through your experience what you thought those expectations were. What did the Mormon church, uh, in your opinion, expect of you um, as a wife and together as a couple? Um, I think I had not sat and examined it until a lot later, <laughs> sadly. Um, looking back, the expectation as a woman was that, uh, that I didn't really have a self. I don't think it was specifically put that way, but it certainly felt that way. Um, you know, the typical advice given to men under these circumstances is marry a woman and do all the things and you'll work out. But it was never with the thought behind of the woman being the sacrificial lamb. And it makes me honestly wonder, in terms of women who are gay, are they given that same advice? Is the church so willing to sacrifice the males in those circumstances as it feels like they are with the women? Uh, I went in thinking that um, if I was a dutiful wife um, and I raised the children and I tended to home and family and made sure he was free to grow um, in his career and in his uh, callings and abilities in church, and that he would then lead our family uh, towards salvation, and that I would work behind the scenes as a support to all those things. That uh, all that you describe, I'm listening to that thinking, A, what a terrible position to be in, uh, and B, how is that even obtainable? Um, it's not, <laughs> which is why I'm here. Um, it, it, it wasn't always all terrible. I think, so one of the things that I, I in coming on and telling my story is I, I want people to understand that we often build these boxes for individuals that we think this is how all women should be or all men should be uh, without allowances to individual needs. As um, having taught, ever since I was young. I enjoyed teaching, I enjoyed raising my children, I enjoyed homeschooling them. Um, and that in that way, I made it my own career for my own development. So that was positive for me. And I still look back on that time very fondly, I miss it. Uh, but in other ways, it was um, really damning as a woman. Because I felt like if I, if my husband was struggling in any of those arenas, um, whether it was his callings in church or uh, struggling to move on 
in work, then it must be that I'm not giving sufficient support. Uh, and it became really apparent, um, especially with depression on both sides, that, uh, that it wasn't working that I couldn't do that. There's, there's no sense of healthy boundaries. I couldn't understand that that level of expectation is not only unreasonable, um, unhealthy, and uh, not in the least supportive to him actually growing as an individual, as making us codependent. I, I want to frame this interview um, maybe with a lens of chronology, just mm -hmm. as things uh, begin to unfold. And I think with all relationships, it's, it's fair to say that the warts and all part of the relationship, the warts and all part of the dating uh, uh, parts of that relationship aren't evident in the first, what I often call the honeymoon stage. That, and I think that's super fair in all relationships that we, uh, we accept all of that in the very beginning because we know uh, that both of us are working forward uh, to a, a new future, uh, a better outcome. So in terms of chronology, really where does the, uh, the dissolving um, or the sticky parts of this story begin? How far into that relationship and, and what are those actual experiences that begin to uh, jeopardize the foundation of the relationship? Yeah, so I mean by outside, um, what people saw from the outside, we looked like we were doing really well. Nobody really knew uh, for a good part of it. Um, and then uh, I was just feeling on the inside, he was super disconnected from me. Uh, I've since learned that that emotional intimacy is super important to me. And so about when we had our third child, um, he was born with Down syndrome and autism. And so I was online a lot, which wasn't typical of me before that. And I was researching everything with regards to him. And then I was also on the side researching things about those with same sex attraction. We ended up um, finding out about North Star. And at the time, it just seemed like such a blessing because I, we felt like the odd couple. <laughs> Nobody knew and we didn't know what to do about that. And we felt super alone. And so uh, we reached out. This was before North Star, North Star had official conferences. This was just the year before. In fact, this all coincided with Josh and Lolly Weed. Um, I had read Josh's story on their blog as coming out. And um, we ended up meeting Josh and Lolly at this conference. And in fact, I remember joking with Lolly, we used to say, oh, it's not that our husbands are gay, that's the trouble in our marriage. What's the trouble? It was the ADHD. It was driving us nuts. But anyhow, so we sat in this space, uh, made friends with them. Um, and I listened to people like Ty Mansville and Danielle. Danielle just had a baby. I just had my son with special needs and we were wandering the halls and I finally felt like I had a sense of community. Uh, within it, there was a lot of discussion about uh, f making community for ourselves. And so I went away with it all gung-ho, saying, you know, we need to find safe people to tell our story to so we can feel supported. Uh, and so my ex and I made plans to talk to individuals within our congregation that we felt were safe. And uh, we began this whole process of doing it. And at first it was really... Uh, empowering for us. I think it was shedding some of the shame that was there and the loneliness that we felt. But then the funny thing is in talking to these individuals, they had no tools with which to bring up the subject again. It was like we, we popped it out and they all went, their jaws dropped. I'm like, okay, and now we move on. Um, and then it was back to that same sort of lonely state. Um, in that time, uh, he kept my ex, sorry, had heard about uh, Journey into Manhood and attended a session here in Arizona. And he had met up with two other individuals that didn't live too far from us, very similar circumstances. And, um, and that was probably uh, the start of it all. I would see him in these interactions with these men. And um, there was I mean, you could call it infatuation, um, a giddiness, a happiness that I saw in him that I hadn't seen in all of our marriage. Um, it was extremely painful. 
if I am to be totally honest. But loving him the way I did, I thought, well, if this makes him more engaged with our family, then I am 100% going to support it. And so uh, I would spend my summer planning activities. They all, these other families had kids the same age as ours, invited them over. And by now I'd had my fourth child. <laughs> and I'd invite them over and we'd have these get togethers. Um, and our kids would love spending time with each other. And I had one other um, spouse in a mixed orientation marriage that I could talk to and connect with. And, and these, uh, my ex had time with these two other men. Um, and on the surface, it was uh, powerful to finally feel like I had a physical community I could connect with in my space here in Arizona. Um, but there were underlying issues with that. Uh, we would find um, uh, boundaries were really hard. In a church where you're not taught to set boundaries or the boundaries are not honored, uh, you know, I think my ex felt like finally he could be himself and it was a relief and uh, he would spend so much time with these other individuals and um, so much money as well. Uh, you know, having a special needs child, everything in our finances up to them was just planning for and needing to take care of us and him. And uh, it was really difficult for me to see him go out on the weekends um, and spend time with him up until two and three in the morning. And I would just beg him when he come back. I, I'd just say, hey, you know, I am so glad you found somebody to connect with that understands you, who understands how it means to sit in this religion and yet want to be faithful to all we believe and still love our families. I'm so glad that you found that, but I need you to set boundaries. We have four children and one is special needs. You're coming back late, you're tired, you're totally not engaged. Um, or you're on your phone with them all the time. and. Uh, and I think this was really hard for him to hear. In fact, initially, uh, his initial responses were ones of blame, like, you just don't want me to be happy now that you see that I am, or um, you just don't get how much I need this. And I was trying desperately as a, a wife and somebody totally believing that this would work, that uh, we could find a middle ground. And it would be nights of tears and long discussions. And um, finally, he'd agree to set up boundaries of being home by a certain time or um, being a little bit more careful with the money he spent. So uh, that seemed like we found our middle ground. We were moving forward. Uh, Father's Day gifts would be like, go camping, take the kids. You guys all meet up with the kids, go camping. Then I can have time out with myself. But then other things started to arise um, where uh, I would walk in and they were watching TV and they were cuddling together. Um, and then I was told that this was something that I had learned in Journey into Manhood. Um, there was a very specific way they were to hold each other so it would not elicit sexual arousal, one sitting certain ways and touching only in a certain way. But the funny thing was that I'd walk into the room and they'd bounce apart. I mean, it was, I was like, okay, well, if there's nothing sexual, why, why this um, instinctive need <laughs> to pretend nothing was happening around me? I, I then learned that that was one of the things that I was told with Journey into Manhood, that, you know, if you had issues, then you could talk to this, this wife of the leader of the group. And, and at the time, I was just so busy with life, homeschooling, four kids, one with special needs. It was a lot um, that I had never really investigated. And uh, it was then explained that uh, one of the things that they did when they went and met out in Queen Creek was... They'd have a lot of these gay men, and they'd get together and they'd cuddle as they watched movies. I've uh, I've been very vocal about these cuddling parties yeah. um, that I knew existed as well. Um, my perspective as a closeted gay man who also 
uh, desperately wanted that connection. I, um, I, I needed to find other people who were like me, who were surviving, who were Latter-day Saints, who had wives, who had children, who had careers that were receiving the tools necessary to make all this work. And so that part of that, the experience as you've described it, is super familiar to me. Um, I also was offered uh, this journey into manhood experience. And I think we should talk a little bit about it, uh, just so the audience understands what journey into manhood is, because it, it continues to come up in episodes over and over and over again. And uh, it is very, it's like an MLM in a way. <laughs> it, it's very uh, well known in the culture, the gay Mormon culture, mm -hmm. because often a lot of the men who facilitate these journey into manhood events are also Latter-day Saints. Yeah. And, and so through this network of, oh, did you know so-and-so is gay? And then this, this small web of closeted gay men uh, come to know and understand and learn about each other. They go into these journey into manhood programs. And that is what this acronym GYM uh, stands for. Journey into manhood has many forms. And you've, I think, very uh, accurately described what I know journey into manhood to be. Uh, they are often opportunities for men to uh, use baseball bats to attack effigies or mannequins of men who are to represent their fathers. And for being distant fathers, uh, out of touch fathers, they're able to use uh, these, um, I, I, even, I hate to even say therapeutical, because um, I, I would do that in air quotes, this, <laughs> these methods by which uh, people are these facilitators believe we can overcome um, or change behavior or become okay with our sexuality. So the beating of these effigies, there's also um, a belief among the journey into manhood participants that homosexuality is caused by having an overbearing mother, um, that having a helicopter mom in a way is what nurtured men to be gay. Uh, and often uh, sometimes too effeminate. And so there are rebirthing uh, scenarios where men are put under blankets and they're, uh, they reenact the, the birth where they, they rebirth themselves as someone new. And if it does sound, this sounds bonkers to you, it is. <laughs> yeah, it's it certainly is. not based on uh, anything out there that you would find in psychology and study. I mean, uh, a lot of the the belief in the church were those old style things you just simply hadn't had a healthy relationship with your father and masculine activities and that your mother was too much <laughs> and and therefore if we can reset all that give you the opportunity to have uh healthy relationships with men, that then you would no longer have that desire, that that desire to be with other men was just misplaced, uh, unfulfilled needs, which, you know, it, it might be true for some people, but it's not true for all people. Uh, also uh, extremely unfair to uh, the parents because you then peg their parents into these certain, you're the overprotective mother and you're the ab absent father. Um, so there's that aspect. As for my ex, he actually, he was told not to tell me what happened at gym. And uh, the only thing he did review, and he actually held to that. I think it, it speaks to a lot of what we were taught in the church about certain things being sacred. They're not secret, they're sacred. Uh, and and that, that, that whole prospect of what happened out there was very sacred. Uh, the only thing he did reveal to me, which wasn't supposed to be revealed to me, was the healthy touch, as they phrased it. Um, and it was only because I had seen it and seen it so often, and it was becoming a point of contention that he'd finally spoken to me about it. This healthy touch is these cuddling sessions yep. that you uh, accurately described. And, and other, uh, other groups, aside from Jim, and you brought in North Star, <laughs> many of those men who participate in North Star also either facilitate or participate in these gym events or events that are similar to gym. Uh, so those uh, methods um, and those experiences have now kind of flowed uh, into that space as well. And so many different varieties of them are happening. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, uh, personally, 
being invited to these uh, cuddling sessions or healthy touch experiences was far beyond anything I was ever comfortable with and, and couldn't participate in them in my own mixed orientation marriage for a variety of reasons, one of which is the, the whole, the literal aspect of that just felt like it was uh, infidelity, yeah. uh, both physical and emotional to me personally. And as I think you also accurately described, when someone, when something begins with the caveat uh, that this is secret mm -hmm. or sacred or special and not to be talked about, I think we should throw some red flags. <laughs> Especially when it's a marriage, right? Where you are, if you're keeping secrets from your spouse, that, that's, that's gonna doom <laughs> your relationship fairly quickly. How many, um, how many opportunities uh, did your relationship experience these gym meetings? Uh, how, how often was your family impacted by these gym or other similar uh, experiences? So we only attended, he only attended one gym session. Um, we went to North Star conferences twice. Um, quote unquote the first one wasn't really a conference i'm told and then uh these activities outside of it that were arranged among those that had attended journey into manhood was almost every weekend um i i look back at that and I, and even even as i talked to my ex about it he he mentions that it felt a little weird that they could do that around me but we had shoved it aside. While North Star is not officially the church group for those that deal with same-sex attraction, it, it is certainly what is uh, spoken under the table as, here, reach out to this resource. This resource definitely has a way to make it work. And when you see individuals like Ty Mansville, who um, faithful in the church, active, writing books about it, it feels like, yeah, this, this is the answer. And when you are brought up in a religion to feel like everything that comes down uh, from God or his mouthpieces is what will bring you back to God, you cease to spend a lot of time thinking about it for yourself. In addition to the fact that you're simply kept so busy. I mean, as a mother, I was so busy. I didn't have time to sit and process what this was. Uh, even when they jumped apart from each other, it was kind of like, okay, I'm not comfortable with this. And even as we had discussions about it, I was like, okay, but they say it's going to help. And there's a lot of these men that seem to be making it work. So I guess I'm okay with it. So no time, no time to really um, critically think for myself. I want to begin uh, the discussion of uh, this genesis. This seems to be the, the gym experiences, the North Star experiences, the open communication about the elephant in the room, the no longer camouflaged elephant, the one that now has a name, the one that now has a, um, an expectation, a purpose, uh, if you will, uh, or even a, a realization as being something that exists in your relationship is now apparent. It's now uh, something that you can see, touch, feel, name, smell, uh, and it exists and starts hogging the room. I think you've done a really great job at kind of explaining the experience, uh, the necessity that your ex-husband felt uh, that these gym programs, North Star, that community, uh, other men who are similar to him meant to him. But I'm very curious about what that meant to you. And as you now start to see your husband unfold, does that allow you to also unfold and have positive experiences? Or does it begin to create additional issues um, personally and within the relationship? Um, you know, when you're a mother, and you're told, a woman in this church, and you're told your purpose is to be a mother, then all your thought and focus is along that line. And I was not exempt from that in the least. And then given the fact that there was the additional burden of uh, 
trying to deal with a special needs child. My focus at the time was whatever will engage him more to be more present as a father, I was willing to take because that would help me in my role as a woman. And uh, I hadn't, like there were times once he'd set the boundaries and he was home earlier, he was definitely happier. The depression wasn't so, just didn't sit and weigh down on all of this. He was more engaged when I could say, hey, I need you to work with this child, work with them on their reading or these basic life skills. He was definitely more present. And so for a time it worked uh, because it was meeting what I was supposed to be. Um, it wasn't until uh, we started to see negative mental and emotional health issues with uh, one of our children that uh, that then plays into this whole thing with the Rainbow family that I began to realize that there was harm in this. Like I could sit and forget myself as a human being and forget my the validity that I had as a woman, as a person. I, I thought I could do all that until it touched on my role as a mother that I could no longer tolerate the space. I know this is, uh, this is going to be a difficult part of the interview uh, because we're now going to talk about the hard parts. Um, often the ones that uh, begin the breaking, the ones that start changing things from once was to what will we become? Yeah. Sorry, gonna need lots of tissue. <laughs> so yeah, um, we had, while we were homeschooling, uh, we, we had one child. She was extremely anxious and I really thought it was just about the anxiety. But the uh, depression had reached a point where there was suicidal ideation and I was just at my wit's end. She was only 10, 10 years old. And uh, it was coming out in all sorts of ways. A lot of anger, mood swings. Um, and we, we were taking to counseling and things like that. And it was one day while I was taking her to one of these sessions that uh, she opened up to me, which I was profoundly grateful that she finally felt able to. And she explained to me that she was gay. And, um, and I sat there and, you know, by this time we had told lots of different members in the ward and we had, uh, the children themselves knew, at least the two oldest knew. And, and I said to her and I said, well, you can tell your father, you know, he's gay. And her exact words, which I've never forgotten were, yeah, I know Baba's gay. Baba is father for Chinese. And she's like, but I don't think Baba really believes it. And uh, I was kind of quiet and just, I, I said, what makes you say that? And, and she's like, because he keeps trying to do all the things and pretend he's not really gay. Um, and so we sat with that for a while. Uh, I was not going to force her. I was wanting to respect her boundaries. But we sat for a couple of months with her not telling her father about this. And I, inside, it was just eating me up. And I had asked, you know, was the suicidal ideation related to this? And we would have these discussions on the side. And she's like, well, if I have to live like him, yeah. If I have to be married to somebody else and if I have to be a mother and I have to live the life that you guys are living and he's clearly not happy, then no, I don't want it. I don't, why would I want to live? And it, it's really weird to have a child so young. We, we just don't often give credit to uh, some of these children, but she recognized early enough that that wasn't the life that she wanted. And I, as a mother, was just um, desperate for her to want to live, to want to find joy and happiness. And even if it meant it was outside this 
box that I had built. I wanted that for her. Um, and so I would talk in a more nuanced way. Uh, she'd be in Young Women's and they'd tell her, oh, when you have children. And she's like, I don't want to have children. And they'd be like, oh, you'll change your mind. You're only 11. What do you know? And, and she'd be like, no, I know I don't want to have children. And I know I don't want, it, it was, um, I was still trying to live in that box and then tell her, you don't have to have this box. Yet there was nothing for her to see outside of it. Um, and then at some point she expressed that it was no longer healthy for her to go to church because again, she was hearing uh, the, the norms that were expected of her. And so then she started not going to church and and then we'd get uh, all these sort of condemnation from members without knowing it. They'd see the occasional times that she came. Oh, it's good. She finally came. You've got four out of four of the kids here. That's not bad. Or you've got three out of the kids. Next week, you'll do better. I know that people meant well, but it was it was just awful. Like they, they couldn't know what was going on, that I, I was just trying to keep my child alive. Uh, others, which you know, when she was starting to come out and explain to them that she was gay and then they're all oh, social media, it's those influencers. And I'm like, what influencers? We're homeschooling her. She doesn't even have her own phone. She still doesn't have her own phone. She and her 15 year old brother have to share a phone. Uh, and the only computer we had was one we had in the front room. We all shared together. The only TV they watched was all in the front room. Not understanding that this child uh, was coming to know herself so much better than we as adults were. And that either she needed to shove that all away and pretend it didn't exist so that she could fit in with our family, with the community we had surrounded us ourselves with, or, um, or face the fact that she would be alone, ostracized. I think this, your, excuse me, your poor um, mother heart just breaks because you have uh, your daughter who's in such need of care. You have uh, a church community that is clearly causing some pain and contributing to that pain. Uh, you likely have a daughter who's contributing to her own pain without having the resources and tools um, so this cycle continues to happen. You have spousal cycles that are happening. I am just sitting here on the outside looking in, thinking, Flo, how did you even keep it together? I didn't. <laughs> I, I think uh, uh, COVID really uh, gave me some time. I, I didn't have time to think. It was all about survival. I um, was trying to make sure everybody was fed and cared for and therapies were done with the one child the other one was staying alive and that uh, now my ex was happier and more engaged and and then when COVID came around uh, there was suddenly more time to process really sit down and and think about things because no longer did i have to worry about church duties or ministering duties or in fact, I wasn't even supposed to go to people's homes and help take care of things. All the things that I did thinking that God would bless and fix my family and my husband, fix him from being gay. And, and uh, those things were gone. And so I had time to actually sit and process uh, during that time. And uh, it was actually during that time that I began to go, I, I don't think this is working. Like physically, we're able to do all the things. And if we keep doing it, we could maybe do it, but not at the cost of, the, of my child's life. Absolutely not. That was non-negotiable for me. Um, and it was in that time that I began to put together kind of uh, a plan. I hadn't told uh, my then husband or my child, but I, I was like, you know, I think for the health of everybody, the marriage needed to end. And uh, when I had brought this up to um, my then husband, he it was just a panic. And this was, you know, technically before all that, but he, he just said, you know, no, let's try and make it work. Let's try and go through counseling. Six more years of counseling. And, 
and then all on top of this and I, I said no it's it's not happening it really isn't we are connecting more but definitely not sexually definitely not as a couple and definitely not the way I envisioned that would help um, me feel loved I, and you to feel loved I love that you said me <laughs> because in this space and especially within Mormonism and I don't want this episode to be like this um, like constant dart against the church. But I, this is our common bond and our common thread uh, in this space because uh, the, the church and its teachings uh, are what led your relationship and my relationship in the same direction, both into that marriage and eventually out of that marriage. And one word that we often uh, fail to use in this space is selflessness hmm. and selfishness. <laughs> um, it is okay, in my opinion, uh, to be selfish. It's okay to say me. Mm -hmm. It's okay to recognize that there are things that you need as well. I've often likened this to jumping on an airplane and getting ready to fly and hearing the safety announcement that says, uh, in the event of a loss of cabin pressure, right. masks will fall from the ceiling, right. and you are supposed to Secure your own mask. And then secure your child's. <laughs> before helping other people. <laughs> right. In a very real way, as you've explained this story and shared uh, a little bit about the experience with your ex-husband, he was securing his own oxygen mask. You had to secure your daughter's oxygen mask. You were spending a lot of time ensuring that your husband was receiving oxygen. <laughs> You were ensuring that the church had a constant supply of oxygen. Mm -hmm. You were ensuring that your church family and community believed that oxygen was flowing to your family. Yeah. But at what point did Flo secure her oxygen mask? Or when did you recognize, I'm suffocating? Um. didn't. I didn't for a long time. It was this same child who pointed it out to me. Um, I think because uh, she hadn't bought all in the way I had. Um, she was much more, <laughs> much more a feminist, which I know is, you know, very distasteful in the LDS faith. <laughs> But she would just say things like, well, what if, what if a woman doesn't want to do that? Or what if you wanted to work? What would, what would you, what that be like? You know, uh, she just asked questions and, and I would sit there, well, sure they could do it. And she's like, well, not the way the church says it, you shouldn't. And, and, and then I'd think about some of the other women that I had met and how hard if they had broken out of the mold how often they were judged. And then I, I began to go, well, what do I want? Do, do I want this? You know, and it, it was kind of weird because I, I, I did love homeschooling my children. It was still teaching and it was teaching the people I love the most. But I recognized that in the moments that I wasn't doing those things, I wasn't um, happy being with me. I didn't even know who I was anymore. I, uh, I knew myself as a mother. I knew myself as a wife. I knew myself as the homemaker. But I didn't know me, Flo. Uh, Flo used to love playing music on the piano. Um, Flo always liked dancing. Uh, those weren't a part of my life. And I hadn't examined that in such a long time because somehow along the way, I felt like my validity was based on these roles as a wife and a mother. And so when uh, this daughter would question these things and bring that to my attention, I, I realized, oh, it's just a, I, if I don't uh, give myself permission to know what I want and who I want to be, then how will my children, my two daughters, know what they want and 
how they want to be because there's no model for them. What do you do with that? There are no simple manuals. Uh, there are no training protocol in the church, uh, even in our community. Where do you find the resources and the direction to achieve all the things that you just talked about? <laughs> uh, um, well, first off, you need time. <laughs> if you're so busy doing all the things, there isn't time. So COVID was lovely that way. Learned I like to bake and and try new things and, and go back to my music and things like that. So time is a big thing. Uh, and so when you're caught up in running that hamster treadmill, you just, you, you don't. Um, so taking that time was essential. Uh, being in forums where I could have these discussions. I uh, ended up connecting up with another lady who, uh, who had divorced her gay husband and would listen to her podcast and then listen, have discussions with her. Uh, and she would encourage, you know, finding who you are again. What do you want? Where do you want to go? Your life is just as valid as theirs. Um, and, and having discussions with other women who I was seeing them do that. And the kind of joy that was taking over as hard as it was. And so, you know, taking baby steps in that direction and really feeling uh, coming into myself. Again, sounds so funny that that's what you're meant to do in your teenage years. And somehow that got short circuited uh, through whatever I felt like my role was in the church. And then now doing it again and feeling almost like uh, a second adolescence, if you will. And, uh, but it, it just really feeling happy again. And, and it wasn't even just reflected in how I felt inside. It was reflected in my physical health too. Um, just always had this, uh, problem with my skin and eczema that a doctor had once suggested when I was young, if it might be psychosomatic and my mom was in an uproar over that. And now seeing physically that those rashes and things were going away that, my skin was healthier. It was, it was physically and emotionally and in some ways spiritually too. Every aspect of my life when I was starting to find those parts was just better. That is often um, something we don't get to see a lot. Uh, so people put in the hard work to get to where you're at. Uh, but often we don't do it because the results aren't readily available. And uh, a lot of the pain that you've described and talked about are things that people don't want to talk about. <laughs> they want to keep those uh, difficult parts of the journey hidden, which I think is uh, the beauty of an episode like this, hmm. is to be able to share uh, really some difficult stuff and some vulnerable stuff. The, the reality is that you divorced, mm -hmm. um, which brings a whole new aspect to this uh, relationship because it means separate households. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it means giving each other the opportunity to love and be loved more completely. Um, it gives you uh, the ability um, to now begin exploring uh, parts of yourself as you've, I think, done a really great job at, at explaining that you didn't know existed before, uh, allowing the seeds that had been planted previous, an opportunity to sprout. I'd love to just to kind of understand how that unfolded for you. And, and what things did you not expect to happen, mm -hmm. happened? Um, so, so I was the one to put out, to say we needed to get a divorce. And I think for my ex, he was still running that hamster mill, treadmill. And so uh, it was a little bit it was a lot for him to process. I was super excited and I had a whole plan laid out. I was like gonna stay with a friend and like literally the whole plan laid out. Uh, and uh, when we finally made it public, I had fully expected people to be supportive of both sides. Um, you know, understanding that, that uh, 
he's gay. <laughs> was, was, and, was that publicly shared that that was the reason why you're divorcing? Um, so yeah, so we had actually separated um, right around Thanksgiving and we'd gone through Thanksgiving Christmas in living separately. And then I had told him, I, I really need to tell people that this is going on. I need to be able to find support. And um, I, previous to this, I was really careful never telling his story except for one person. I'd always check in with him because I felt like his having same-sex attraction wasn't my story to tell. But by this point, I had finally figured out that I was a person too and that his story had become a part of my story and that I, I was going to post this. I was going to be super respectful. So I had actually written up a Facebook post and I had him read it as well before I posted it. Um, that's how much I wanted to respect him in the process. And it was in part because I didn't want to explain this over and over, and I'm sure he didn't want to. And we had friends all over the world. I mean, all the way to Australia. Family was out there, too. And so, um, yeah, we posted it publicly on Facebook. Really, really interesting responses. Um, I think because we'd come out of, you know, November 2015, the whole policy and how the church was trying to paint themselves as being much more LGBTQ friendly, that people were reaching out to my ex and saying, we love you no matter what, come, come. Um, he was still going to church and every time they'd see him, they'd welcome him. He's, uh, he was no longer the elders quorum president, but he was just like, wow, I'm getting more recognition and <laughs> hellos and hey, how are you than I've ever had. Um, and then mine was the polar opposite. <laughs> um, I had people reach out and say, because they knew that I began the process. And, um, and I, I don't fault them. I recognize that what they say is what they've been fed for so long. They don't know what else to say. And they can't know how harmful all of it was. But there would be like phrases like, oh, but you guys were making it work, or he wasn't the one that wanted to leave the marriage. Totally negating the fact that I, as an individual, deserved happiness as well. He was willing to live through. Why, why would you cut it off? It's an eternal family you're breaking up. And they would lay all that blame on me. And then I had others reach out that fully expected me to throw him right under the bus. Um, that we're in the private message, you know, just going, well, I don't see why you're not more mad. And, and I was like, I was mad. I spent so many years mad. And then we went through counseling and I processed. I'm still mad. Don't get me wrong. I'm still mad. But I recognize we are both caught up in a system, not of our own making, one we were born into and fed day in and day out that if we would check all the boxes, God would make it right. And we checked those boxes again and again, and God did not make it right. And it was killing us and could quite physically kill one of my own children. And so, you know, trying to explain to people like, I, I get that you're angry for me. I appreciate that. But I still have someone I need to co-parent with. If I throw him under the bus, what is that going to do for my children, for their relationship with him? There is a bigger picture here that we all need to um, find a way to navigate, that he can understand that I'm in pain. I can understand that he's in pain, that we both need to heal and be able to express, but without laying the full burden of blame on each other so that we can, in a healthy way, navigate what we still have to do with our four children. One of our children, is, he, he's nonverbal, Down syndrome and autistic. We fully expect that he will be with us until he passes or until we pass which is a whole nother thing to navigate too. So 100%, I needed to make sure we could still have a working partnership. But I just, I just hadn't expected people to lay so much blame on me or fault me for not reacting the way they expected me to. I love that you uh, brought up 
which I believe is a completely accurate uh, understanding of this uh, by referencing systems, not people. <laughs> the system um, that you're referring to uh, clearly is our faith tradition that has promised over and over again that uh, righteous church service, checking those boxes, missions, marriage, children, mm -hmm. the blessings of the temple, uh, continued service in the church through callings and responsibilities are all methods by which, in your words, God fixes you yeah. and makes all things right. How do we address systems without harming people? Hmm. <laughs> if I had all the answers, <laughs> I thought that was the job of the prophet to do. <laughs> Touche. Sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I don't know. I, for a long time, I had hoped to stay um, in the church as a voice of nuance, as another perspective. I had always, just given the fact that I'm culturally Asian, sat in that space and made comments that way. Uh, and so I was fairly comfortable with it. And so I thought I could do that. But I, it had just come to a point where when, when you lose social capital and you become uh, labeled as uh, unfaithful or um, just a, a lazy learner or all the other things that, uh, that you get labeled and then you lose that social capital, you realize that your voice doesn't hold much water. And then there's also just the simple fact that uh, I had to deal day in and day out with people physically, knowing our family was in this space, knowing my daughter was suicidal, and coming up and knowing that there were others in the congregation who were uh, in the Rainbow family, so to speak, at, and getting up there and reading. The answers to all this can be found in the family proclamation. <laughs> giving a whole talk on it. And I had people texting me in the middle of that going, are you okay? Is your family okay sitting and hearing all that? Because they could see that this was going to be so damaging. Just knowing that that, I, I'd never know when that was going to come up. And, and so then just recognizing we couldn't. There were other aspects too, where for a while my ex was still going, he was taking the youngest. She still loved primary and she was reaching baptismal age. And uh, she'd go to activity days and somebody would say, oh, I'm, aren't you excited to be baptized? You know, and, and she'd come home and ask me, you know, well, when am I going to get baptized? And I'd say, you know, just really cautious, just saying, so, okay, if you want to choose baptism, I'll honor that. But your father may not be able to baptize you. And explaining that whole thing. And she's like, well, why? And I said, well, there's this whole worthiness thing. And, 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 and it bothered her. She's like, it's not, it's, it's just like worthiness. It's, it's almost like, cause she had just finished the whole unit on civil rights. And she's like, well, why can't he, he has the priesthood. Why this is just like with the blacks, except the LGBTQ. And, and then she'd have other things where she'd come home and ask, well, we learned in a lesson today that God answers prayers of those that are obedient and faithful. Mama, Papa isn't faithful anymore. He's not obedient. So does that mean God doesn't listen to his prayers? So which then put her in a position to totally question the authority of her own father. Uh, th all these things were putting rifts in our family, which is why we, we just finally said no. Like we can't, our family comes first. Like for a church that speaks of family first, um, families can be together forever. They sure don't make it easy to do any of that uh, given where we sit. We, they were just ripping us to shreds. So we know, um, no, no spoiler alert, that you do end up uh, divorcing. Yeah. What does, uh, what does life look like on this side of the aisle now? It's been really, really good. I, I was really, really worried um, about ne negotiating a lot of this. Um, so for which I need to thank you for it, because I had heard your story on Mormon Stories, and I was like, oh, they, they managed to divorce, and it seems like it's amicable. And, those late night messages while well, you you were so busy with so many other things and just you know explaining how it could be done i uh, we look to other people to model it we are 
really, really in good space. Um, there is a lot of co-parenting that has to happen with a special needs child, a lot. And um, so we're in constant communication. It's all amicable. Uh, he has been able, I think one of the things that he expressed that was stressful for him was taking on all those things that I had wanted him to be a partner for. It was a lot for him. It was like drinking from a fire hose. Um, and he's managed it beautifully, for which, you know, I fully acknowledge and he's fully acknowledged that he now understands what I needed when I said I needed support in the role. And and uh, I have my weeks off and I can fully sit knowing that he will care for the children. And I have my weeks on and and he has his time off. And if there are things like vacations that we need to negotiate. We do it. We still do family vacations. You can't travel with a special needs child without another adult there. It's impossible, especially one who has a habit of being a bit of an escape artist. <laughs> so we spent Christmas going to Disneyland for the first time with everybody there. Um, in the summer, we'd all gone to Mexico City. Uh, we These might not be as frequent anymore, and we recognize that, but it, it's just, it's nice to really finally have a partner with the family and we're both happier and more engaged we have more honest conversations and uh, more connection usually a fear and i i say this because i recognized uh, this in my own mixed orientation marriage my own relationship and something my wife ex-wife said to me uh, prior to us divorcing is she said uh, who would ever want someone in their mid-30s with four children? I will never date again. Uh, no one will ever love me. Mm -hmm. Is there love on the other side of this door? Um, I don't know yet for me. I assume there is. I have begun a new journey along those lines. You know, when you're, your husband is gay and your daughter is going through... Uh, you know, trying to understand her own sexuality, I realized uh, along that whole exploring line, I hadn't ever investigated my own. Um, so I, I, I hope there is. Uh, regardless, I think right now what I value the most, if you talk about love, is loving myself. Just um, rediscovering who I am. I'm giving myself space to um, enjoy that part of me. And so, I mean, along the way, I definitely discovered I'm demisexual. So that entailing meaning for me to feel any sexual attraction, there needs to be a very uh, intimate closeness in, in relationship and what we can share. Um, for me to feel that. And it hasn't been restricted to just male or female. I don't know where else that might go. I mean, it's a, a growing thing. This is, uh, there's not very many people who know. So in a way I'm kind of coming out now. <laughs> um, and so I hope there is along the way, but I, regardless of where that is for me, I know that I really am valuing loving myself. You are such a beautiful soul. Excellent. And I am so much better for hearing your story, uh, for witnessing this transformation from the original messages that you sent to the opportunity to be able to be here and, and listen to uh, your story as it's unfolded. And as it continues to unfold, I think the beauty of a platform like this is that um, we're restricted by no boxes that you continue to allude to. I don't want to put you in a box. I don't want you to feel like you need to be in a box. I think the, the beauty of, of opportunities like this is that each of us can tell our stories exactly where we're at today and know that tomorrow those stories will allow us to make progress. Those stories allow us to move in a direction that is now allowable with no walls and with no guardrails. Yeah, which, you know, I have to own. I held up those guardrails for a long, long time. 
but there's the other piece I was taught them. I didn't know there could be anything outside of it. And now that I can see there's something outside of it, it's, there's just a lot more, a lot more true freedom and agency. What part of uh, this episode um, or this experience uh, haven't we talked about that you know uh, or plan coming into this saying, I really want the audience to get this out of my story? What haven't we talked about that you want to make sure the audience hears? Um, I think the one that strikes me the most, and which I've had individuals reach out to me for, um, the ones that have been really wanting to hear my story and not tell me my story, um, are the ones that are realizing that they may have family members that sit in this rainbow family. You know, uh, it's a, a beautiful story that the church paints for us if you fit in that box. And we automatically assume everybody fits in it. Um, and it feels so cozy and sweet and all set out beautifully. But what we don't realize is that when we hold to that box so tightly, other people sense sense that and so they're afraid to express anything outside of it and uh you know i had a mom reach out and explain that their child is is gay but their child is expressed but 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 i i you know i just i don't see myself marrying i don't see myself you know leaving the church or anything like that and um and i i didn't get the chance to tell her i i everybody should live the best that they know how. Seek out what they know is best for themselves. Don't take any other authority over it. But what I, I really wish I had said was, don't hold so tightly to that box that your child feels like they can't be who they need to be. Or your spouse. Don't hold to the image that that's, if I held to that box, that, that my family had to be that way or my family was destroyed for eternity. I wouldn't be where I am. My ex wouldn't be happily in a, a relationship. I wouldn't be happy being a person, a human. My daughter wouldn't be happily herself with no, no suicidal ideation. If we hold too strongly to what we think things should be, we never get to see what things can really be. Just to let that growth process happen for everyone. Love it, and I, I think like none of us expected this path. None of us expected this rainbow journey. It's what we do with the unexpected that makes the difference. As you were kind of sharing that, I was just thinking how much better uh, and more opportunity your ex-husband has. Uh, I think of your daughter and the opportunities that she will now, now have the bandwidth that she will no longer have to waste in hiding, uh, keeping from the world the beautiful parts of who she is, the crushes that she may have, uh, the support that you can give her as she explores uh, those opportunities. But most importantly, the same, that go, the same things that can benefit and work for you. Yeah. And those opportunities, all things that we didn't expect no. To experience. No. And if people ask and say, you know, is this really what God wants? Then I would just say, what did Christ really teach? He really did. He, he taught us to seek and support each other in love. And that's, that's really what I think this is in the end. Far more than any other standards or <laughs> images that we're told are right and wrong. I love it. This has been really, really good. Uh, to borrow Mormon terms, I have been spiritually fed. <laughs> I think uh, I think it's just been a, a wonderful conversation, and I'm thankful that you're in a spot where you're able to share that. And uh, it indeed will be an episode that I believe helps other people. And for that, I say thank you. Well, thank you. I, I hope so. I know I'm not the only woman. I can think of plenty of other women I've been in contact with that aren't within our faith. We, it, it is not just our faith. It is a societal expectation that we were handed and then reinforced by with faith. 
Um, so everybody needs to have more grace for themselves as they figure out their own journey and for each other because there's so much to unpack. Bottom line, uh, we must do better, full stop. We yeah. have to do better. Families uh, require us and deserve better than this. People, humans, not even just family. We're all, we're all humans. And we all deserve that love in that space. Flo, thank you. <laughs> thank you. If you um, have a question uh, for our guest, if you have a question about your own mixed orientation marriage, your own experience, a comment as well, we invite you to share that uh, on either of our platforms, Facebook or YouTube, where you can leave those comments. If you're watching uh, on a video version through our website, there's a comment section there as well. Or listening in an audio version, we invite you to participate however you may uh, throughout these channels. I didn't ask, but you you are social media savvy. If people do have questions, um, yeah. are they open or are you welcome uh, uh, to allowing them yeah. to reach out? Yeah, to you? so um, on Instagram, I, it, being a teacher, you are supposed to keep all your social media <laughs> locked up. But uh, my Instagram is seeking myself truthfully. Um, welcome questions there. Um, yeah. Sounds like a, sounds like a plan. Thanks. <laughs> Again, thank you. And for our Latter Gay Stories audience, thank you for giving us uh, an hour of your time to better understand this experience. Uh, again, we invite you to uh, use our social media channels to share uh, and comment about this specific episode. And if it did mean something to you or to somebody that you think may benefit from it, we invite you to share it with them as well. It's stories like yours, it's stories like mine, and stories like Flo's that help us each continue writing our own latter gay story. <laughs>